breakfast this morning. And um, we're glad to have Richard with us and Dusty. Uh, they're going to introduce their, their spouses, I'm sure. But uh, we are glad. We've been looking forward to having Richard with us. And uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask our ushers to be ready to come on down. We're going to take our offering this morning. And we're also going to take a love offering for uh, Richard. So uh, whoever, who's going to be our ushers this morning? All right, we've got Jonathan and and Robert, looks like. He's, is he moving or is he getting ready? No, he's not. Okay, is he? He is, yeah. It's kind of like an auction. If you move, you bought it. You know what I'm saying? So, all right, guys, if y'all would, come on down. Good to see y'all this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we love you today. Thank you so much for being a God of perfection and holiness and eternality. You deserve worship. And we ask that you bless our service today. I pray that you would anoint Richard as he plays for us. Uh, sing to our hearts through his music today. Thank you again for being a, a great redeemer. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Now we're going to have lunch right after service this morning, so don't anybody go anywhere. It's all set up. We've got a ham in the oven, and Frank's going to go get the chicken here in just a little bit, so uh, we'll buy everybody's lunch, okay? I want you to hang around. We are glad to have uh, just a dear friend of ours. He's been coming here for a number of years, and every time he comes, uh, his, his fingers speak to our hearts, and we're glad to have Richard. Richard Kaiser, we're going to give you much time as we've got till about 11.30, so listen fast, and I'm, I know he'll play fast. I'm glad to have you.
song was kind of a newer tune uh, from Mercy Me. Uh, and I fell in love with the song, especially after I read about why the lead singer for Mercy Me wrote the song. He wrote it for his 10-year-old son that was being bullied in school. And he was trying to teach him the word. And uh, I, I learned the, the scripture because I'm a gun guy. Uh, and uh, someone told me it's, you know, you can always remember this. It's, you'll never forget this scripture as a reference. Now, because if you, uh, if you know what a 44 Magnum handgun is, one of the most powerful handguns, this is my 44 Magnum scripture. 1 John 4.4. 4. Says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world.
become really special for me uh, for two reasons. You know, it, it, well, when I first started this, I guess it was about 20 years ago when we started off in the ministry this time. much of lacking self-confidence and just not thinking that we could ever make this work and do this. And, and I'll have to say that my wife was the one that was my encourager to, to push me out, to step out. And uh, so she's the one that helped to, quote, raise me up so that I could climb on the mountain and walk across Stormy Sea. But then the second meaning is, you know, uh, if you listen to a lot of preachers today, especially televangelists, you know, that they, they're really good at ear candy. All you need to do is accept Christ and your life is going to be smooth sailing. Think positive and send lots of money and you're never going to have problems. Well, we learned that that ain't so. You know, life still happens. God never promises he'd bail us out every time, but he always promises that he would go with us through these trials, and he would raise us up to climb on the mountain and walk through stormy seas. And so this song has really become special to me, and uh, I think it has a, a gospel message anyway. Well, you raise me up.
Well, this is a brand new guitar, and this is all the songs that I've taught it, so. It's really high tech. It's uh, all carbon fiber. And McPherson just sent it to me a week ago. So, you know, I thank God for great sponsors. Yes, ma'am. Well, Hannah still exists, but you know we always uh, we always have to have just one woman. <laughs> I have a T-shirt that says "One Wife, Many Guitars." <laughs> this is actually a brand new one as well. So this year I have two new girlfriends. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm just going to do a couple more songs. I'm going to have Dusty come up and sing. But I did want to say uh, I thank, uh, thank you guys for helping to uh, support our ministry as we're out on the road. Uh, and, and I'd like to just give you a brief update. I'm doing a lot of work now with Guitars for Vets. Uh, they made the official ambassador last year. And so part of my job is to just make people aware. I'm a, I'm a veteran. And how many veterans are here this morning? Quite a few. Thank you. Amen. We're raising funds to buy guitars, to put them in the hands of more veterans, to teach them to play, to treat for PTSD. And uh, uh, God has really been blessing that. And, and uh, when I'm at home at the VA hospital there right in Salem, Virginia, I go to the VA and, and teach, uh, give guitar lessons and work with some of our, our veterans. And I'm really thankful. But thank you for helping to support this this ministry. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a star. I'm not a uh, uh, I don't call myself a gospel musician. Uh, Florida Baptist College gave me the title of musicianary, and, and, and I wear it proudly. But uh, uh, I do have a brand new book, uh, and I only have just a few copies. If if I sell out, you can get it from Amazon.com. But uh, the book is about how God brought me through PTSD. I'm a veteran. I served in Korea during Vietnam, came home, got shot. Turkey hunting. <laughs> Pastor, don't be making notes about that. <laughs> I was mistaken for a wild turkey, and I know he's going to get a lot of miles out of that. But uh, uh, the book is, is about how God brought me through PTSD, and a portion of that book sale does go directly to Guitars for Vets. So uh, this is an old Chet Atkins style tune. It says, I've got that old time religion in my heart. This is one you can put your hands together on. <laughs>
Dusty, come on up here. Dusty's got a song that he has been uh, singing around the country, and, and people are just loving it. I never cared for it myself. <laughs> I'm kidding. Bring him on band. He, he is such an inspiration, and uh, so I want him to share this song with you. And uh, thank you again. Keep us in your prayers. You know, uh, I think I don't think God's through with us, with us, but uh, you know we. Need prayer as we go along. So uh, thank you, Pastor Jim. Is that on purpose? Have y'all enjoyed Richard so far? Yeah. Everybody's having a good time, so fix and change that. How many of you believe that we need Christ back in, in, in America? There's a lot of things that happened in the last few years. It's taking Christ out of everything, and you know, when you take Christ out of the equation, what's left? Nothing. This song that I'm fixing to do was written in, uh, in 1996, and it was very fitting for America then, and I think it's even more so today. It's called We Want America Back. Something is wrong with America. She wants hair. I do not love what she has become. Scripture says that blessed is the nation of God is the Lord, and America has forgotten the godly foundation upon which she was built. Something is wrong. Our children are asked to attend public schools, which in many cases resemble war zone, without even the most basic right, the right of any soldier to pray to the God of heaven. Many times, the wild eyed, drug addicted, gun care, and teenagers. It's allowed to stay in school while our Supreme Court decided to expel God from the classrooms over 50 years ago. Something is wrong. Television, they about far the citizens of our nation with the idea that wrong is right, that abnormal is normal, the abhorrent is acceptable, and what God calls an abomination is nothing more than a lifestyle, and it's had its effect. 50 years ago, the number one television program in America was the Andy Griffith Show. Look what we have today. Something is wrong. When our government can pass out contraceptives to our children in school without parental consent, and Gideons can no longer pass out Bibles on campus, something is wrong. When our leaders can say to your children and mine that premarital sex is all right, so long as it's safe, yes. 
something is wrong. You're not the one that's ready for a change. I will say to my government, I'm not raising dogs in my house. I'm raising children created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. And I'm going to teach them the Bible. And if the Bible says it's right, it's right. If the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. The only hope that we Americans have today is for godly men and women of character to stand together as one mighty army and declare to the immoral, the impure, the obscene, and the foul, your days of unlimited access to America are over. The army of God, which has been silent for too long, is taking America back. We want a Our hearts. We're glad you're here. Let me get this. There we go. Yesterday was Richard's birthday. That's all I got to say. It was his birthday. <laughs> now we're going we're gonna to have lunch now after uh, service this morning. And uh, so wish him a happy birthday, and uh, thank, thank all four of y'all for coming. It's been such an honor to have you. Next Sunday, uh, we've got lunch again for a different, a different cause. We're going to have a baby shower next week, and lunch and a baby shower for Michael and Chelsea. So um, I think she's registered at Bass Pro, and <laughs> so... So in your, in your gift selection, just keep that in mind. <laughs> Be back tonight at uh, 6 o'clock, and we're going to discuss tonight. Where did my thing go? Did it fall? I knew I was going to forget. There we go. Yeah. Um, tonight we're going to be looking at the issue of uh, the 21st century challenge, and I know what you go through every day. Because you're average, and I know what the average American sees and is exposed to. So we're going to talk tonight about why is it so difficult for people to sit through a 30 or 40 minute verbal presentation when they are so accustomed to visual presentation everywhere else. And I know it's hard, and so we're going to look at that tonight and uh, deal with some of those issues. In uh, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians 9, this is our stewardship month, February is, and next week we're going to do our Faith Promise pledges, and Faith Promise is uh, how we fund or help fund our missions program here, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more next week. But uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse number 6, if you're there, say amen. If you're not, say wait a minute. Good. Good, good. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, sparingly means plants few seed. So the guy that doesn't plant much seed is going to reap not much fruit. 
And he which soweth bountifully or plants many seeds will reap many things that come from the seeds. All right? We'll, we'll reap bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or out of sorrow or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. I love the word cheerful. It mean, it's, it's a Greek word, hilarion. What does that sound like? Hilarious. Yeah. God loves a hilarious giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, the Bible is a book of divine instructions and principles revealed by God to his people for the purpose of providing them with specific and sufficient direction, discretion, and assets to complete their assignment that God has given. Everybody has an assignment. Every human being, every Christian, put it that way, every Christian has an assignment. He's got a life purpose. And my purpose is not my decision. My purpose is my discovery. In other words, God already knows what he has designed me to be. I don't until I get saved, first of all, and I begin to seek his purpose for my life. Then, through a variety of people and circumstances, God will reveal that to me. But the Bible was given to us not just for the pleasure of study, not just for the pleasure of memorizing blocks of text so we can impress people with how much we know. It is literally for the prosperity of our participation. In other words, the Bible is a, it's a fuel bank that I, I draw from its reserves and I draw from its truth and it is what gives me the mental, spiritual fuel I need to function in my culture. Well, Bible truths, are they're living precepts. They're not just uh, literary axioms. They are living, breathing precepts that when I embrace these things, and the way you embrace them is by the, uh, is by the power of agreement. And so when you agree to participate in the principles of the Bible, it's a time-released truth. And by time released, I mean you will have these things stored in the mind. And when a particular circumstance arises, that will release itself. David said it this way. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed. By remembering. And so you might not remember everything you need to know right now at this moment. But when you are faced with a very difficult situation, the Lord will trigger a truth if it's planted... If, if the truth is there, he will recall that from memory, feed your spirit with that. That will be the bridge over which you can pass the situation that you're in. Because often storms will blow you into the will of God. All right? Paul was blown to the right island. He was going to Rome. But Eurycladon, that named hurricane, came and blew them to the island of Crete. That's where God wanted him. And so it took a storm to get him there. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 teaches a major concept about the way God moves and transports assets into the lives of his people for very specific purposes. God is the God of spiritual assets. I think everybody would agree with that. You're saved by the grace of God. All of the spiritual blessings that we enjoy in life are not given to us by uh, anything other than the person of God. He is also the God of capital assets. You pay your bills using the capital assets God's provided for you. That is not outside the realm. Your checkbook is a theological document. Your credit card statement is a theological document. Your, uh, your history on your computer browser is a theological document that tells God and tells you and anybody else that has access to that just exactly what feeds you, what you like, what you enjoy. Well, the, the, the might of this illustration, can we've got, uh, Nathan hit that first slide. There, I, I told you there was one, but there are actually two. Uh, look at verse number uh, 8 now. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. All right, now, everything starts with the person of God. Everything. He gives salvation. 
He gives you encouragement. So he is the, he's the beginner, the genesis of all of this. Now, it moves down. We're going clockwise now. All grace. All. This is a terminal amount. Everything you need. Grace is the dynamic life of Christ in me that gives me the desire and the ability to live in harmony with God and his word. So God gives me the grace. And involved in this, this balloon of grace are the physical assets I need to take care of myself and my family and to be a blessing to other people in life. And so I have all grace given to us. This is, this is what God blesses us with. Now, what is the purpose? Let me read this to you. Verse 8. He is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having sufficiency in all, all things to take care of yourself may abound to what? Every good work. Why does God give to us? First of all, you have needs of your own, right? Anybody here have a car payment, house payment, insurance, uh, medical bills? Anybody buy shoes, cars, uh, grocery? We all, we all have bills, okay? Um, and God uses physical assets he uses money ladies and gentlemen he uses your paycheck he uses your retirement he uses capital assets so that we can take care of these things however look at what also we are to do we are to support what every good work you see God gives to you so that you can give to others so that they can give to others so they can give to others this is the cycle. It's a replenishing cycle. It's kind of like rain, evaporation, rain, evaporation. If it stops raining, there's no evaporation, right? And so this cycle is self-perpetuating. God gives to the, to the believer for the purpose of meeting his needs so that he can give to other people. And so he, uh, he told Moses, I am hath sent me unto you. There is no predicate with that subject. There doesn't need to be. I am. All right? Everything I am, I have always been. I don't grow. I don't increase. I don't evolve. I don't learn anything. I don't, I, I don't go anywhere. He's, already, he's always known everything, and he's always been everywhere. And so God is the perfect, only, continuously present being. Did you know there's no past tense with God? He existed before the past. He will exist after the future. And so everything God is right now, this is what, February the 24th, 2019. Everything God is right now, he was 500 trillion years ago. He has not, we've not taught him anything. We have not exposed him to anything that he did not already know. God exists outside of time. We don't. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you're going around a mountain. Can everybody see this, by the way? Uh, there's a mountain, and there's a train. And this train is coming around a mountain. And let's say that on the back side of this mountain, you were in the last car on the train. Okay? And let's say somebody else is in the first car of the train. Now, is the guy in the first car going to see something that guy in the last car doesn't see? So he can't he he can't see back here and he can't see up here. This is this is our dilemma. We are trapped in time. Now, the only way that I or anybody else could see the back car or the past and the front car, the future, how could you See both of those simultaneously. Yeah, you'd have to be up here. Hmm. Well, I'll be. You'd have to be God to be able to see the past and the future simultaneously. Folks, you realize who we're dealing with here? You realize we're not dealing with a really um, hyper human being? We are dealing with a God who exists outside of time. And the Bible says that he gives us these assets 
All right. There's God. All right. And he gives us all grace. Pardon the handwriting. Just trust me. This is what it's saying. All right. <laughs> all right. He gives this to us so that we can give to every good work. Now, all of it centers around what? All right, his glory. And the word glory means to reveal the reputation of. So whatever we do, we are to do for the purpose of revealing the reputation of God so that when you leave a conversation, when you leave a situation, people should know more about God than they did before that conversation began. That's our purpose. That's our, that's our role in life. And so we are, now what if, what if a guy, let's say uh, God has blessed him financially. And so he's, God's given him this grace, given it to us for every good work. But he says, uh, well, I don't know. I need to start something over here. Well, what does he do to the cycle? He breaks a cycle. And pretty soon, it's kind of like, oh, theological socialism. So you're going to run out of somebody else's money at some point. You understand? You're going to run out of the money God's given you or the assets God's given you. If, if, if I'm doing something over here and if I'm not participate, you will never go without your need being met. If you stay in this cycle, you know what I'm saying? You, you will not out give a God who, what, what are his capacities? By the way, what is the limit of God's capacity? I don't understand that. I can't explain that to you. I, I know um, I, I, I started, what, nine months before September the 5th. I didn't exist before then. God did. We all have a birthday. We all had a beginning. Country had a beginning. Everything has a beginning. Everybody wears, well, nearly everybody wears a watch. What's this for? It's to tell you when something starts and when something ends. You got calendars. Y'all got calendars on your phone, your, your tablets. I got a big old calendar, big old paper calendar. It tells me when stuff starts. When stuff begins, that's, I am tied to the train of time. I can't see tomorrow. I don't know what's around the mountain. God does. So, therefore, I don't have to. Now, if I step out of this cycle, the cycle, God doesn't, God doesn't willingly say, all right, I'm, I'm through with you. When we break the cycle, you're washing your car, and you're pulling the hose to get a little, you got to get around the rear end of your car, and the hose kinks. What happens to your water? Did, did the city come out and shut your water off? What happened? You kinked your hose. Well, I just don't know what to do about that. Well, then you ought not be washing your car then if you don't know. Just unkink the hose. Start the process again. And so people who, who are all of a sudden, I just, man, we can't, we can't afford to give. We, we just can't. Oh, there's a kink in the hose. Unkink your hose. Well, what happens when you unkink your hose? Well, once again, you start the cycle. This is a self-replicating financial cycle, a cycle of grace. Nobody ever encourages me. I just don't understand it. Hmm. People are just so impatient with me, I just don't understand. Really? What might be the problem? Could it be that your emotional hose is kinked and you don't encourage anybody? Could it be that you don't have patience with anybody? Nobody loves me. Really? That's kind of a, a self-convicting thing. When I begin to complain about the things that other people are not doing in my life, it just simply tells me what I'm not doing in anybody else's life. That's why God gives us grace so we can support every good work. And so the, the source of my sufficiency, praise the Lord, is, is not the federal government. We're broke, folks. If the federal government was a household, you know we're $17 trillion in debt? You hear that? You got a credit card that's $17 trillion in the hole. We're broke. So, no, I'm not going to look to the government to take care of me. How about I look to a God 
who always has capital assets. I, I, I know this. I don't know much about God, but I do know that what God does, he does well. The sun, for instance. You know how long the sun's been burning? Well, if the sun was created close to the, the date of the creation of the human species, it's been about 6,000 years. But you know, what does a fire need in order? A fire needs two things in order to burn. What does it need? Fuel and oxygen, right? Well, the sun exists in outer space where there is no oxygen. How does that happen? The sun is a huge nuclear reactor. It is where hydrogen basically turns, burns into nitrogen. And it's, it's nuclear fission. It's a self-replicating thing. And it has, it's been going for thousands of years. And I'm just telling you this. God will entrust you with as much as you can handle and will keep this cycle fed. Does that make sense? If, if I cannot be trusted to participate in this cycle, then the hose gets kinked. And so the person that says, well, we're going to do everything else first. If there's anything else left, we'll tithe off of that. You're kinking the hose. And you're going to run out of assets to take care of this over here. And so God's ability, you're exactly right. God's ability is unlimited. It is inexhaustible. His will is the supply. What would you do right now if you could will things into existence? How many of you drive a new car tomorrow? All right, we got one. How many of you live in another house? How many of you have better health if you could just will it? Okay. <laughs> You would change many things about your life if you could will it. Well, that's the way God functions. God wills into our lives things that we will put back into circulation for his glory. That's why we actually call money currency. It's a current. It flows. Now, what do we call a a stream that does not have an outlet and it just stays still all the time? We call it stagnant we call it the dead sea which has no outlets to it now who is to be blessed by us i mean we're uh, you know what is a good work there are y'all get stuff in the mail all the time wanting money has any of you and i've received several this week uh, phone calls somebody wanting money Oh, Mr. Harris, this will be your final call. We were calling about your car's warranty. Yeah, right, exactly. You don't even know I got a car. What are you doing? (laughs) People always want money out of you. Now, how do you know what a good work is? All right, Nathan, let's walk through this one line at a time. Are there some qualifications for a good work? Yes, yes. It must be initiated by the mind of God. Behind the whole thing must be God started it. God was the genesis of this thing. Number two, it must be redemptive in nature. It can't just be so people can have their needs met. It's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be more than that. Well, we got to pay the rent, and we got to buy this, and we got to buy that. What is the nature of this work? Well, it's so I can make a living. That's, that's not what we're looking at here. It must be redemptive in nature. In other words, if the individual is being financed so they can participate in the redemptive work of God, then it's possible you've got a good work on your hands. But that's got to be the foundation behind it. Number three. It must exist to God's glory. In other words, when people come into contact with the ministry, they must leave with a greater understanding of the character of God. 
They must depart your presence or your contact or your whatever you're involved with. They must leave with a better understanding of why they're here, what their purpose in life is. And I'm just telling you this. Everybody in here has a ministry, not just your preacher. Everybody has a ministry. You have a life purpose. And as far as I can find in the Bible, it never terminates, at least until you go to heaven. Say, well, I'm, I'm retired. Not from your life purpose, you're not. Now, you may be retired from your job, but you're not retired from your life purpose. You don't, you don't step out of that. You do that. Maybe, maybe you're, you're in a, a new season of your life now. Maybe even a new location. Maybe you even have new clientele, but your purpose is exactly the same. So I just want you to, I want to encourage you that, that you are always that individual that is the assigned missionary to your circle of friends. That's our responsibility. Number four, it must exalt Jesus Christ permanently. Now, this is not a fundraiser. Now, I want you to understand this. I got a thing in the mail here several years ago. And it was, um, it was for 24-hour fast. And it was a fundraiser. A 24-hour fast fundraiser. Can I tell you that obedience to the principles of the Bible is not a fundraiser? See, we're not raising money when we obey Scripture. This is our responsibility it is our obligation it is even our honor to live in harmony with God and his word that's what grace is all about it is this dynamic life of Christ in me that gives me the desire and the ability the desire and the ability to live in harmony with God and his word and so when I am living by grace I'm, I'm functioning in this cycle God can trust me with capital assets he gives me this all grace that we had up on the, on the slide, and I use that to take care of myself. I have bills just like you do. I can't give my paycheck away just like you can't give your paycheck away. I doubt any of you do that every week. You just write, write your full check to somebody else. You, you have needs. You have things that God wants you to do specifically and personally. And so God gives these through grace to me so that I can provide financing for good works. I plant seeds here so those seeds can be planted elsewhere. Now, um, the, the law of the harvest is, uh, it says this. All right, you reap what you sow, right? You reap more than you sow, and you reap later than you sow. Plant one watermelon seed, just one. How many watermelons, Keith, on average, will come on that vine? Oh, yeah, that's the guy I need to be asking right here. Is that four? What, four three? <laughs> you buy, buy fertilizer first. All right, let's say four. All right, I'll say you got four watermelons on a vine. How many seeds did you plant? One. Now you got four watermelons. How many seeds in each watermelon? You see what I'm saying? You're going to reap more than you sow. But you're going to reap later than you sow. You plant that watermelon seed in the morning, guess what? You ain't going to eat off that vine Friday. You know, we got watermelons off that vine. Just give it, give it time to grow and develop. And uh, so, you know, God plants into us his grace. And there are people in this world that have needs that God has given us the assets to assist. And that, that's... Our missions department, there are missionaries over there that don't make a whole lot of money. And we don't, we don't support them just because they're our friends. If they're involved in redemptive ministries that permanently glorify God, that could be a good work. Now, here's the thing. We can't support everybody. There are hundreds and hundreds of, of works out there. We, we can't support everybody. But there are good works that we can support. There are good works that we do support. And you can be a part of that. But I'm just I'm saying if 
if, I, if I'm doing this with the capital assets that God has given me, and I start shaving off, and then whatever's left, you know, I'll, I'll tithe off of that, I'm, I'm pinching the hose. And then I'll start complaining, I don't have enough. And if that's the way God's going to treat me, I'm going to quit church. And the cycle is cut off. And that's, that's where a lot of Christians are today. Blaming God for their own selfishness. Blaming God for their own stupidity, for their own lack of, of obedience to the Bible. And that's a shame. Bow your heads. The first act of grace that God wants to bless you with in life is to save you. He's powerful enough to save anybody, and he's kind enough to wait to be asked. He will not save you against your will. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, being in this building will not save you. It's a good place to be because it is here where you will hear the Bible preached. But you must make that decision. Or maybe you're here and there are other needs in your life. Maybe, maybe the Lord has just burdened your heart. This is where you need to plant your membership. You want to you serve out the rest of your life on earth right here through this ministry. I invite you to come this morning. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for grace. Thank you for sufficiency. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for taking care of our needs, especially the need of our salvation in Jesus' name. And whatever need is in this building today, and I pray that they'll come and simply surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and the rain plays, if you need to come this morning for any need, would you come right now? Thank you for being here today. Richard, thank you. Rusty, thank you. Man, I enjoyed that song. That was powerful. I appreciate uh, your ministry. Now, we're going to eat lunch, so don't anybody go anywhere. And uh, just file right back through this hall, turn left at the double glass doors, and about three miles later. <laughs> all right, and I'll be waiting on you uh, at the bar. But uh, stay and eat lunch with us. We would love to have you. And uh, then be back tonight at 6 o'clock. And we're going to look at uh, challenges to preaching the Bible in the 21st century. And uh, be, be, uh, be here at 6. All right. Uh, let's see. Next Sunday, we're going to have lunch next Sunday. Baby shower next, uh, next Sunday afternoon as well. I think that's all. I think that's it. Y'all ready to go eat? All right. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Bless us as we fellowship now. Thank you for blessing us with all grace that we can provide for good works. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, by the way, Richard.